we are going to be looking at the book of Ruth this morning, the book of Ruth. Uh, if you're not familiar with where that's at, uh, no, no problem, we will help you find it. So it's really towards the front end of your Bible. The book of Ruth is there. Uh, if you go through the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, really the story about God's creation, how the earth came about, and leading up to Moses' story and the leading of the Israelite people out of Egypt. And then you're going to hit a couple of J books, Joshua and Judges, and then right after that is the book of Ruth. It's only four chapters long, so it's kind of uh, easy to miss if you're not paying attention. And if you're still not familiar with where that's at in your Bible, you can go right to the front to the table of contents and find Ruth and the specific page number for your Bible today. But we've been in a series entitled Transformed, and we've been talking about incredible transformations that God does in the lives of ordinary people and sometimes not so ordinary people, and the transformation work that he does. And he's done that with a man by the name of Jacob, who was a deceiver, and God used him to become a national leader. He did that with a guy by the name of Joseph, who could have been really frustrated and angry with people, but he made him out to be a forgiver, and God used him for incredible things. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about a man by the name of Zacchaeus who was a wee little guy, tiny little fella, and God did some amazing salvation work in his life, transformed him from the inside out. And then last week, we talked about Peter, a man of, uh, who had some pretty big failures, and God used him as one of the greatest success stories in the Bible. If you missed that, I encourage you, you can always tune into those or just read over their stories for yourselves. You can tune into those on our, our Call Church app or on YouTube as well. And today we're going to be looking at Ruth and her mother-in-law by the name of Naomi. And before we jump into this passage, I just want to show of hands, how many of you love watching a good movie? Anybody here like watching a good movie? I think most of us do, right? Because they usually tell a story, and uh, they navigate through, and the Bible is filled with stories. It's, in many ways, I, I play scenes of it in my head as I'm reading through it to imagine what the scenes look like. And there's some of you here, how many of you are action movie type people? You love the stuff blowing up, you love uh, probably like all the Avengers films, you love uh, uh, Jason Bourne, whatever, I mean those types of things. That's you. And there's stories in the Bible that fit that. If you've never read through like David and Goliath, that's one of your favorites. Or you look through the story of Joshua, reading that book of how he was a conqueror. Or a man by the name of Gideon with 300 soldiers that went into battle against thousands and became victorious. Or even Samson who pulls out a donkey's jawbone and wails on a thousand guys. I mean, how cool would that be, right? I mean, that's incredible stories. And that, that's the kind of movies you like. How many Western people here? You like a good old Western, right? Right, and that's you. And maybe it's the story of Elijah when he goes up against the prophets of Baal. And he's like, you want to show down and let it go? Right, and that's you. That's just, you think that way in the western side of things. How about for you, uh, don't raise your hand here because you're a church horror. I said don't raise your hand, right? But that's you. You like stuff like Judas' story is right up your alley, right? You're like, that guy's a betrayer. He's terrible. Or maybe the demonic people of some guy running down and, what do you want with a Jesus, the son of God? It's like, oh, I love that. You're weird. Anyway, the reality is a horror. That's you. Some of you like comedy. That's kind of your bent. Any comedy people here? I love a good comedy, right? And just reading through some of the Proverbs. It's just, it's funny. Some of it is funny. Better to live on the rooftop than with an argumentative wife. You're like, oh, man, that is so good. You know, Solomon knew what he was talking about. So the reality is, and some of you are living that out, and it's not so funny. But the point is that I'm trying to say, right, comedy is your thing. And it's in the Bible. It's in the Scripture. Some of you are romance people. Oh, you love a good romantic movie. Some of you even like romance with comedy. Oh, a rom-com. Whatever that may be, right? It's, that's your thing. But I'm going to tell you honestly, out of all of those, I can handle a lot of it. The one that I can't handle is drama. I am just not a drama person. Sometimes my girls, uh, I've got five kids. My wife will say, you want to sit down and watch Anne of Green Gables? I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> We're going to force you to do that. And you know what happens? I, in five minutes, I'm either sleeping or I'm out. I can't, I can't do it. And yet today, we're going to look at a story that, if I'm really honest with you, is a little bit more of a drama. There's romance involved with it. There's not action. There's no Western theme to it. But I think it has a tremendous amount to share about, just about our lives personally, about transformation. And as a matter of fact, if you were to to title this story. Several years ago, a movie came out. I never watched it. It was entitled Four Weddings and a Funeral. This one would be the opposite of that. It'd be three funerals and a wedding. And it's a moment of tremendous hardship, a moment of difficulty, a moment of challenge, a moment where somebody feels hopeless. 
And my hope and desire today is that you will move from hopelessness to hope-filled, that you would move from maybe a lack of joy to experiencing at least a glimmer of joy, from darkness into light today, because it's the story that we're going to look at. Many years ago, a movie came out. I don't know if we've got the, the screen. Did anybody see this movie called Up? So we, I've mentioned to you already, we've got five kids, so <laughs> these became a lot of the shows that we watched were these, uh, you know, cartoons. And uh, you guys remember this guy here if you saw that movie? Uh, yeah, some of you are like, I wake up to that, you know, so, but uh, that's neither here nor there. But, um, but the interesting thing about that movie is if you watch it, and I'm sorry, I'm going to, spoiler alert here, listen, it's been 25 years, if you haven't watched it by now, you're way late to this, but... But the reality is, this guy who you see right there, they show him meeting a girl, they get married, they have some challenges, and in the first roughly five to seven minutes, it ends with his wife passing away. And I remember watching this the first time going, this movie stinks, right? What is wrong with these guys? And it's the rest of the movie that starts to unfold and gives him purpose once again. He comes and counters, and I, I won't spoil the ending for you if you'd want to watch that, but a guy who's lost everything, and the problem is if you push the pause button in his darkest hour, you can get stuck there. And I wonder if maybe there's some of us today that have gotten stuck there. And it seems like your life is in this spot where there's no hope, there's no joy, and if it's not for you, maybe there's somebody that you know that is going through that. And I think Ruth and Naomi's story have a great deal to teach us about how we can be transformed to hopelessness, to being hopeful. So let me give you the perspective of what's going on. And I know we're going to blast through this today. Uh, we've, if Ruth is four chapters long. And so I'm just going to hit kind of the main topics and the themes as we navigate through this this morning. I'd really encourage you to maybe spend some time and read this over in the next uh, couple of days. It'd be a 20-minute read, and you can get the entire big picture of this. But Ruth is written in a time period known as the Judges in Israel's history. Israel is without a king. <clears throat> they have been led out of Israel. Joshua, their, their commander who has taken them into the land, is no longer with them. And they go through roughly a 300-year period where the Israelite people are being disobedient to God. They cry out to him because they are in desperation. God sends to them a deliverer or a judge, and he rescues them through that deliverer, and they get back on track with the Lord. And this goes on for roughly 300 years. That time period that we're going to be reading is roughly in that probably 1200 to, to uh, shortly before, uh, maybe 1300 to 1100 B.C. What we are reading today, 3,000 years old. I mean, it's incredible when we really think about that, and God has preserved his word and his truth for us. And there are the, these, this couple... Elimelech and uh, his wife Naomi, who live in Bethlehem, and a famine comes upon the land. And because the famine is there, Elimelech and his wife Naomi leave. They leave their land, and they go to a place called Moab. And that's where we start to find and discover the story and what is the truth about hopelessness and how to move to hopefulness. If you're taking notes, I want to encourage you to write this in. It's the first point in your outline. We all, we will all experience dark days. Would you just say that with me? We will all experience dark days. If there's ever anybody that says, oh, I've never had a tough time in life, they're probably lying to you, right? There's going to be seasons. There's going to be challenges. In this moment, there's a famine in the land. They don't have any food. They have to pack up their belongings, this married couple with their two sons, and they head to a foreign land. And the question mark is, should they have gone to begin with? We don't really know exactly that answer. Many scholars said they should have never left Bethlehem to begin with, but they do. And look what happens in verses 3 through 5 of chapter 1. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malion and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. You talk about a dark day, some dark days. She moves because of a famine in the land. She loses her husband, her kids marry Moabite women, which they shouldn't have done to begin with. They were outside of the, the clans of, of Israel. And then in the process of all of this, her two boys die. Three funerals. It's a brutal moment. 
It's a brutal moment of time. And after a period of about 10 years, she hears that the famine in the land has stopped. So she makes a determination. I'm going to go back. She tells her daughter-in-laws, she said, go back to your people. Go back to the Moabites and, and, and you know, maybe find a spouse or a husband there. And in and, and, and some persuasion, some things happen. And finally, Orpah, the first one, says, okay, I'm heading back. But Ruth says, please don't encourage me to leave. Where you go, this famous line, where you go, I'm going to go. Where you stay, I'm going to stay. Your people are going to be my people, and your God is going to be my God. And in that process, Naomi and Ruth head back into Bethlehem. And this is what it says in verses 19 through 21. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi. Her name means pleasant. Don't call me that anymore. Call me Mara. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter, which is what Mara means. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. I wonder if there may be some of us here today that feel that. I wonder if maybe there's a few of us that our life was once one thing. And even if you read through the passage of Scripture, it's like the people didn't even recognize her. Ten years have been really tough on Naomi. That she doesn't even want to be called by her previous name of what people knew her. Call me bitter because my life has been hard. These have been some very dark days. And maybe for you, it is the loss of a loved one. Maybe you've gone through a similar experience to Naomi. Maybe for you, it's the breaking of a relationship that was really important to you. Maybe it was a dream that you had that got crushed. Maybe a, a job. Maybe you've lost your financial way. Maybe a business that fell apart. Maybe for some of us, if we're honest, challenging moments with our kids a move that you thought was going to lead you to a better future that didn't turn out the way that you had thought. Some other dynamic in your life today. I don't know where you may be at. But if you're honest, maybe for you, you're in a dark moment. You're in a dark place. Maybe you know somebody who's in a dark place. Or maybe you're just coming out of that. The truth is it's going to happen to every single one of us. It happens in the Bible. And so my hope and my prayer this morning is not that we would stay there, but how do we get out of that? Because do you believe in a God who brings light where there is darkness? Do you? Yes. You guys are killing me. I, I can go longer if we need to, but do you believe in a God who raises sun from the dead? He brings light where there is darkness. God comes in with indescribable light and indescribable hope and indescribable joy. And what, how does that happen in these ladies' lives? So I want to give you a couple, of, a couple of thoughts here from moving from hopelessness to being hope-filled. The first one is this. Start believing in new beginnings. Would you say that with me? Start believing in new beginnings. Would you say that like you really mean it? Start believing in new beginnings. These two women come. They've been out of the land for at least 10 years. They come back to Bethlehem, and this is what it says in verse 22. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem, and I think it's this ray of light as the barley harvest was beginning. What have they been feeling? What have they been experiencing? A famine has been in the land. And Naomi and Ruth have experienced a famine in their own lives personally. It's been dark times. But now they are coming up on a new moment. Something is about to change. There is a new season that is coming. I don't believe that dark days are designed to be permanent. I believe that they are seasonal. How many of you would say that we had a long winter this year? Anybody want to agree with that? Anybody get tired of the snow? I sure did. I got to be honest with you. Every Sunday morning, I'm like, please, Lord, no more snow. I don't know if I got to cancel this thing. And, you know, we got 17 feet at our house. And I, no, it wasn't quite like that. But, but I, there was weeks that I'm like, please, let the snow go away. And for some of us, dark days, but then the light starts coming through. Look at, isn't today just amazing? What do we got? It's like 117 outside. I mean, it feels that way because we haven't seen this for so long. But it's the, it is God's light coming through, and there is a season for difficult times and challenging times. And yet there is a new season that God wants to bring into your life. Thomas Edison, as most of you know, invented thousands of things. But in December of 1914, he had worked for 10 years on a storage battery. 
This had greatly strained his finances, and this particular evening, spontaneous combustion had broken out in the film room. Within minutes, all the packing compounds uh, for the record and the filming, all flammable goods were all in flames. Fire companies from eight surrounding towns arrived, but the heat was so intense and the water pressure so low that the attempt to douse the flames was futile. Everything, everything that he had was destroyed. Edison was 67 years old. And with all of his assets going up in flames, the damage exceeded $2 million back in that time, right, 1914. And his building was only insured for $238,000. The question became, would this break his spirit? The inventor's 24-year-old son, Charles, finally reached, searching for his father, finally found him. And calmly, as his dad was calmly watching the fire, his face glowing in the reflection, his white hair blowing in the wind, Charles said, my heart ached for my dad. He was 67, no longer a young man, and everything was going up in flames. And when he saw me, Charles said, he shouted, where's your mother? When I told him I didn't know, he said, find her, bring her here. She will never see anything like this as long as she lives. And the next morning, Edison looked at the ruins and said, there is great value in disaster. All of our mistakes are burned up. Thank God we can start anew. And three weeks after the fire, Edison managed to deliver the first phonograph. And I share that story because I think the reality is we can look at difficult days in a couple of ways. One, for some of us, we hit the pause button on our life and we get stuck there. Maybe a fire has blown through your life, maybe physically. Maybe you're here in Amador County because of that. I have no idea. I know some moved from the other counties because their, their, their past house was destroyed. Maybe it's not been physical. Maybe it's, it's a figurative thought of a fire has been ripping through. And it can, it's bringing difficult times and challenging days. And I want to encourage you. I believe wholeheartedly God can start new things. It's, it's a new season. And I want to be clear, for some of us, we may be grieving through some dark days today, and I'm not suggesting just get on with it. Our grief and that process may be very, very different, and our time period may be different than others. But I don't believe that God wants you to stay in that season forever, that you've got to start thinking and believing that God has a new beginning for me, another chapter to turn, that that doesn't mean I forget my past, but I cannot live in my past and I can move forward through it. And that God has better days ahead. That the rest of my life can really be the best of my life. Do you believe that this morning? I believe that he's capable of doing that. The second thing is, keep looking for God's fingerprints. Keep looking for God's fingerprints. It's the rest of the story of Ruth. In Ruth chapter 2, chapter 3, and the beginning of chapter 4. It starts in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. It says, Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. And Ruth goes out. Now, let me give you some preface here. Remember, they had come back from this land of Moab. They have no husband. Neither Ruth does nor Naomi. It's a, two, two widows, right? They're living there. They're, difficult time. How are they going to provide for themselves? And there was a process back in Israel's time called gleaning. And in the harvest time that we just read about, what would happen is the harvesters would go through the fields, and anything that the harvesters did not pick up was left for those who were poor, who couldn't afford that they would be able to come in behind harvesters of any, anybody in the, in the town and pick up stuff so that they could have food for themselves. This was a process. And so once harvesters went through, they weren't supposed to go back and get all of the remains. So Naomi tells Ruth, go out and do that. Ruth goes ahead. She finds a field and she begins to glean behind the harvesters. And as it turns out, that's a key phrase, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz who was from the clan of Elimelech. She just happened to find herself there. Ever have those moments in your life? You're like, this is so weird. How did this just happen? And we call it, what, a coincidence? And I call it God's perfect plan that you're not paying attention to. She goes out, and it's as it turns out, no, 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 no. God is directing her there. She finds Boaz. She begins to glean. Boaz sees her, knows who she is. He begins to help her in this process, begins to give her goods, begins to help. And, and so this is what ends up happening at the later portion of the chapter. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law when she comes home about the one whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today was Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said. He has not stopped showing kindness to the living and the dead. And then she adds this. 
That man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Now, in Israel's time, if a man was married and they didn't have children, the next of kin, the closest of kin, was to take that woman as his wife, and they were supposed to have a child, and that child would really carry on the name of the deceased husband. And so when Naomi says this, he's one of our kinsmen. He's a close relative that could take care of us for the rest of our days. Do you think that this is an accident according to God's perfect plan? No, it is not. And the story continues, and I would encourage you to read this. She continues to glean in his field. He continues to bless her. And on one night after the harvest is done, Boaz is sleeping. She goes and she begins to lay at his feet. There's nothing sexual involved with this. And when Boaz awakes, he sees her. And who are you? It is Ruth. And she says, cover me. This aspect, it's the ultimate Sadie Hawkins dance. You guys remember those back in high school where the woman would come up to the guy and say, hey, you want to go to the dance with me? Do it or I'm going to, no, right? It's, would you go to the dance with me? And this is exactly it. Ruth is saying, hey, would you take me as your spouse? Would you care for me and for my mother-in-law, Naomi? And amazingly, Boaz agrees, except there's somebody that's a closer relative so the next day, Boaz is taking care of business. He says, hey, I'm going to get in front of all the townspeople. And he does. He brings the, next, the closest of kin. And he says, hey, will you buy the property from these women so that you can provide for them? And the man says, I will do it. And then Boaz says to him, and you're thinking, oh, man, this is blowing the whole story. What's going on here? And then Boaz brings up the point. If you do that, you've got to marry Ruth, the Moabite. And the guy's like, I can't do that. Now, I don't know if he was married. I don't know if he's like, I've already got one wife. She's tough, too. I'm not going to. I don't know. We just don't know all the details there. But he says, I'm not willing to do that. Would you do it? And Boaz steps up to the plate. And in, in, in uh, chapter 9, excuse me, verse 9 and 10, it should say of, of chapter 4. I think here it says chapter 3. But in chapter 4, it says, Boaz announces to all the elders and all the people, today you are my witnesses. I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead and his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today, you are my witnesses. God's fingerprints throughout the whole thing. I wonder if you've ever seen that before. Uh, and I wonder if we're honest, how many of us are missing God's fingerprints? Because we call it coincidence or just luck. And I wonder if maybe you're here today and even just being here is God's fingerprint on your life to say, I brought you here for this specific reason. To hear something. That if God is with you, he's still working. He's still doing his thing. And we can trust him in that, which leads us to the last one. Always remember that God has a plan. Don't ever forget that God, even in the midst of my challenges, has a plan. At the end of this book, we see in verses 13, 16, and 17, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he made love to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. And catch this. He was the father of Jesse, who was the father of who? David. David. And if you're thinking, is that the David? It's the David. Do you see that God had a big picture plan in the midst of all of this, that I am going to bring Ruth into this process, and I have a plan for this Naomi. You are going to be uh, the, the great-great-grandmother, great, great, grandmother, I don't know, I'm not doing my math right there, of David. And not only that, if you go to the book of Matthew, here's what's even crazier when you start to think of it. Matthew gives the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and guess who's in the genealogy of Jesus? Ruth. That's where this starts. God has a game plan for your life. And I just want to encourage you, don't miss out on that. He's starting maybe a new chapter. His fingerprints start to look for him. And maybe we don't see it, but we can trust that God has a plan. Several years ago, I got the opportunity to meet uh, somebody here at our church. Uh, it was probably about a year and a half ago. And I just, as I heard her story... And what God had taken her through, and yet her outlook on life and how she operated, I was just uh, very moved that day. And as I thought about this and hardships and difficulties in life, 
I thought she would be a great testimony and an example, probably for all of us, of somebody who has risen above, who has seen God's fingerprints, who has trusted in God's plan, and not allowed herself to get stuck on the pause button of dark days. So would you guys do me a huge favor? Would you guys warmly welcome Selena Clark to the stage with me? Do I need to turn this on at all, Josh? Yeah? Okay. Oh. Uh-oh. Oh. There we go. You want it down? Oh, that's perfect, Selena. Here, let me do this. You got some space there. There we go. All right, girl. Here, I'll let you get right in front of that microphone. <laughs> well, Selena, I've got a handful of questions for you that I would love for you to share. Can you share just a little bit about your, your story and... Uh, Maybe some of the dark days and the challenging times that you've had in life. Okay. So um, I was born in Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, two days before my second birthday, my biological brother, who was only three at the time, found, found some uh, matches and uh, started playing with it and accidentally let um, set the couch on fire. But he didn't know it, thankfully, and went to another room. And um, the flames spread to the playpen where I lay sleeping. And there was no burn unit. Um, actually, there's no, still no trauma center in Hawaii. So I was flown to um, San Francisco. And because um, uh, um, a church there had actually heard about me and um, started a prayer um, team for me. And um, so I was stabilized in San Francisco and they needed to find a, a couple who, because um, there would be tons of surgeries I'd have to have. And um, they just needed a list of people to call. And the clerks were living in Folsom at the time, but they went to church in San Francisco. And um, when the church um, was looking for people, they um, called my the clerks and um, said, hey, she'll probably go back to Hawaii, but um, would you be willing to be one of the lists? And they, um, my mom said yes, and future mom said yes. And um, my dad was like, uh, I'll pray about it. <laughs> and um, But he felt like God nudged him and said, they're gonna offer you this child, what are you gonna do? And he was a brand new uh, born and grown Christian at the time. And he's like, you know, in my past, I didn't think I had, um, I did very well in a former family. And I don't know if I can love this child uh, the way she needs to be loved. And, um, but he just still felt like God was nudging him. And uh, sure enough, the hospital called and said, you know, I hope you were okay with this because um, we went to interview all these couples who might take care of this child and all we saw was your name and phone number and then we called Hawaii and all they had was your name and phone number and um so my dad was like well God the only reason that um there has to be a really good reason for this to happen so I'll take the kid and he was terrified <laughs> So he was like, what? White knuckled all the way from Folsom to San Francisco. And I guess um, I was really, really short back then. It was three and a half. And uh, the dress I had was like three times too big for me. And I had a bonnet of all things that was two sizes too big. And um, I marched in and my dad turned to my mom and said, I think I've fallen in love. So um, even like in... God had not forsaken me. He, um, he still had his hand on me. Hmm. And so uh, really early in the relationship, um, my dad was reading the Bible, and he had a bookmark with the Good Shepherd on it. And uh, I went over, and I said, I know that guy. And he's like, how do you know that guy? And he's like, that's Jesus, and uh, he held me in the fire. And it's interesting because the medical records um, – where I was not burned at all was behind my neck and under my knees as if someone had helped me. Mm. And um, 
another time was, because um, like I said, I was not their child. My dad turned to me and said, how come I love you so much? And I said, Jesus gave me to you. He's like, how do you know that? He says, I said, because you hold me on your lap and you kiss my face. And um, a little later on, like I was four at the time, we were in Folsom, and I couldn't get out or couldn't get into the house, and I got mad, started kicking the door, and um, sort of, I was, of course, swatted because of the potential uh, damage to the property, and um, I sat, down, sat me down and said, you know, Jesus who saved you in the fire, if you ask him to be Lord and Savior of your heart, no matter what you go through, if you um, pray to him, he will always be able to help you. And so I was saved when I was like four years old. And then around 10, I was baptized. But um, when I was nine years old, my biological dad wanted me back. And um, it was interesting that we're doing Ruth because um, like uh, Pastor Ryan said, with Naomi and uh, Ruth, they had an option to either go back to Moab or go back with um, Naomi, and I love that uh, verse in the Bible, whither thou goest, I will go, where thou lodgest, I will lodge, my people will be thy people, thy people will be my people, and thy God my God, and so my dad sat me down and said, okay, you have the option, you can go back to Hawaii and be with your natural family, you know, we love you, but it is your choice. And so I said, well, you are my family. And um, so at nine years old, I had to write a, um, a letter to uh, the social workers in Hawaii. And I said, I want to be a Clark. I don't want to be a Reyes. And um, still, my dad's like, I'm going to fight for you. And so we went over there. And um, my biological dad said, got up and said, you know, I see how Selena is with the Clarks and um, how much they love her and um, she loves them. And I love her too, but I love her so much that I'm willing to let them be um, her parents. And so that's how God's hand was um, in a dark day. Mm. He, um, his hand was over on me. Yeah. So that's my testimony. Hey, so before you go, thank you for sharing. But one of the things for you, Selena, is I see you walking in here. You, you're one of the fastest walkers I've ever seen in my life. You're just like, whoa. <laughs> so, <laughs> but one of the things that is so cool is I just always sense you just got a joy and a spirit about you that is just at times just so infectious. And I don't know if there's something you could encourage somebody with. Of what what has created that for you in your? I know we're being a little spontaneous here. That wasn't one of the questions I asked, but but I think just that aspect of seeing God's hand as you shared, but but trusting in His plan and even in the midst of that, how did you how do you maintain hope in the midst of some some hopeless times? Well, actually, that's interesting because um, we had a ministry trip to American Samoa and. Um, I pulled a quote when I was, like, young and actually smart. <laughs> and uh, I said, the one that they, um, when they interviewed me at 12, I said, if you have problems within your family and wish you were dead and you weren't you, then think again because there's a lot of disabled people who don't have everything that you have. And think hard and then say slowly to yourself, thank God for making me me. Mm. Mm. That's awesome, girl. Hey, don't go too far yet. So, hey, would you guys join me in a prayer for Selena? God, I just thank you for this young lady and what you have used her to do even today and how I pray that you would continue to use her story and her testimony to bring honor to you and yet that she would just continue to be a light, a beaming light in, uh, in days of darkness for others as well as you have done for her. So thank you for her just being willing to share with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Selena. Appreciate you sharing. So I just want to conclude with this. I don't know what your dark days are. I don't know what God has seen you through. And maybe for some of you, you're on the, the tail end of that chapter of your life and you've turned the page. And, uh, and I want to celebrate that with you. But maybe for some of you right now, if you're honest, that's where you're at. 
And I, I want to encourage you with these words. Maybe you're here today and to realize that there are new beginnings that are in front of me. And that God has a new beginning. That the pause button of my life doesn't have to stay here. And that he has a work that he wants to do in you and through you. I, I want to encourage us for others that maybe we've realized that, but it's hard to grab hope that you would start looking for God's little signatures in your life, his fingerprints on conversations of people that he's brought into your life, of even maybe moments of bringing you into a church community or moments just like this. I have no idea what it may be, and to start realizing that there is a bigger purpose and a bigger plan, it is not just accident, it's not just coincidence, and that to that point, that God has a plan for your life. That he wants to use your story much like he's using Selena's story for his purpose and for his kingdom. And maybe for some of us today, if we're honest, our dark days is because we've run from God. Maybe you got bitter in life because of some circumstances and maybe you've been pointing the finger at him. And Naomi and Ruth could have done that. The truth of the matter is Selena could have done that. And said, why would you allow this? And I don't want anything to do with you. And maybe today is a day of stopping running from God and coming to run back to him, or maybe for the very first time, you'd acknowledge that your dark days are because you've never even had a relationship with God. You don't know that he's got a new beginning for you, that his, he wants to be doing a work in you and through you, and that he has a perfect plan for your life, that you were created for a purpose. You are no accident, and there is a meaning for you, but you don't know if you've got a relationship with a God like that, and you want that today. I've got great news for you. God wants a relationship with you. He is in pursuit of you. As a matter of fact, so much so that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you on a cross 2,000 years ago to pay the penalty for your sin. And in that moment that we acknowledge that we are separated from God because of our behaviors from turning our back to him, and we come and we put our faith in Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive us, our relationship with a loving God that's got a purpose and wants to bring light into your darkness is restored. And you can have that confidence as you walk out of here this Mother's Day of 2023. And if that's you, in just a moment, we're going to say a prayer that you could start that journey for the very first time today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? God, I thank you for the story of Naomi and Ruth. I thank you that it's not always a lifestyle that is perfect, where everything seems to be going right. As a matter of fact, most of the time, it's not. We're going to experience darkness, challenging times, difficult seasons and hardships. And God, I pray that you would remind us all that there are new beginnings. There are seasons in our life. And just because we're experiencing something one day doesn't mean we have to stay there for the rest of our days. I pray that you would bring that encouragement, that you would fuel that in some that are here this morning, that there is a new chapter and that there are better days ahead. God, for others of us, that we would begin to see your work in our lives and give you acknowledgement for that, to recognize that you are at work, that you're working details out, that there is no happenstance, there's no, there's no mistakes. You're doing something. And give us eyes to see that. And God, that we would always remember that no matter what, there's a plan. Just as you had a plan for Ruth and Naomi, that ultimately they would be in the lineage of David and in the big picture, your son, Jesus Christ, here on earth. That there's a plan for each and every one of us. And maybe this morning that plan starts with entering into a relationship with God. And you don't know right now as you sit here or even as you watch at home if you have that relationship with him, but you want that. You want light to break through into your darkness. And if that's you right now, I would encourage you maybe to say, just a very simple prayer like this in your heart to start that journey. God, I need you today. I feel like I'm in a dark spot. It's a difficult time. And I don't want to do this alone anymore. And I don't have to. Because I believe you sent Jesus Christ to die for my sin. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life to forgive me, to give me a brand new start and to bring light into my world, to bring hope to my hopelessness, to bring joy once again. Would you fill me with that today, I ask. In Jesus' name we pray.